The title of today's message is Making a Comeback. There's so much happening in the news today, and I was just surprised when I got up this morning. I went through the, the message and everything and started watching news real early this morning and, and saw that there was that shooting. I didn't realize until this morning when I turned on the news that that shooting in El Paso. And I kept thinking, man, this is Texas. I'm surprised that somebody in there didn't have a gun. Amen. But uh, guys, that just reminds me that there is evil in this world. And there's going to be evil in this world until the Lord comes back. And I'm not talking about when Jesus returns to take us to the church, takes the church out, to rapture the church out. But I'm talking about on that dreadful, dreadful day when God, the day of the Lord comes and, and He opens up the judgment, His judgment on this world. And all of the evil is finally done away with. They're cast into that lake of fire and what's left is all of us in heaven. So after God makes a new heaven and a new earth and that new Jerusalem, His capital city, where He dwells right now, comes down to this earth. And we dwell with Him forever Amen. in that new city. We just got through finishing up the book of Revelation. It's reading it so fresh on my mind about that. But that's when it's gonna that's when it's gonna happen. There's gonna be evil in this world. In fact, it's going to amplify. It's gonna get worse. It's gonna continually get worse. Have you ever noticed that it's way worse than it was back when our parents were growing up and even when we were growing up, if you're old like me, I'm fifty seven. Mm -hmm. I know it don't sound real old, but I've been around a little bit and it's gotten progressively worse. It really has. I, I can't pinpoint when it happened, but I think it started happening about when we started taking prayer out of school and things like that. Amen. Trying to make God take a back seat. You know, that's, uh, that's kind of where it all started with me. I've seen in here lately that, uh, you know, let me go back to the beginning. Y'all know me, I'll go back to the book of Genesis in a heartbeat. Right after God created everything, everything, He created everything, the first order of business for Him was the wedding ceremony between Adam and Eve. And after that, the family unit started because uh, they became one in flesh and, and, and had Cain and Abel and later Seth. Human race started right there, but it started with the family. That's how important family is to God. It is the most important uh, relationship other than our relationship with Him on this earth. And through the family, God's good godly families, His morals and standards are upheld. Amen? Amen. But uh, today, you know, it, it, this would really make a good Father's Day message. It really would. But uh, I'm not, it's more like a fatherhood message. You know, because the, uh, it's not just the fam family that's under attack. It has been for a long time. But it's the fatherhood that's under attack in this country. I can't turn on the news hardly without seeing some fool talking about uh, the toxic masculinity or something like that. They just lump all men in one category and figure they all have, a, have the making of being a rapist or a, a wife beater or something like that. They're just no good for nothing. That's, that's the, uh, the impression I get in some of the, when I watch some of these uh, news programs. It's kind of frustrating to me. But when God created everything, and I went back to the beginning, and that's why I'm trying to set all this up, Going back to the beginning when He created everything, He created a natural order that He wanted to see happen and needs to happen. And that is that He made, uh, he made Adam man the leader of that family, of the, of the family unit. To lead His family in the things of God. That's the way He made us. And the devil's been a 
been after us ever since, trying to mess up that family because he knows if he can mess up the family unit, he can mess up society. And he's done it. And he's been very successful, if you think about it. You know, but the, uh, like I said, guys, he created fathers in a, in a certain way, and I'm not trying to diminish women in any way. God, <laughs> the very thing that he did, the last thing he did in his creation was took a little bit more time and created woman. So he made man out of the dirt, but he created woman. <laughs> took a little bit more time. He spent some time, and he did a real good job. <laughs> He really did. I am pleased <laughs> with the way God has, has made uh, my wife, for sure. But uh, the family's been under attack, but especially fatherhood has been under attack. You look at, guys, the absentee fatherhood uh, from the family, th that can be, uh, you could probably point to that as, been uh, as being one of the, the major downfalls of society. Because fathers need to be in the home. They are to lead their families. They are to teach their children. Love their children. Raise their children. That, that not to, now, I'm not saying it because it's natural for mothers to teach their kids. To raise their kids. It's natural. That's the way God created them. But men, it's a little different with men. The image of God that we have is God the Father. That's the image of God we have. Women have the, the Holy Spirit. The image of God is the Holy Spirit. That means that they want to fix things. They want to take care of things. And they have that natural uh, inkling, uh, natural desire to, to, to raise and take care of their children. I'm not trying, I don't want to sell that short in any way. But my main focus here today is men and uh, how God sees the the, the role of the, of the husband and the father. It is up, for fathers, up to fathers that God uh, has put the... Uh... Let me ask you another question before I get deep into it. How many of us growing up that had a father, maybe didn't have a father, but uh, maybe a, a, uh, a dominant uncle or something like that, or just mm -hmm. a male figure in your life, grandfather or something like that, you know, that uh, they would teach you in such a way, it's almost like a proverb when they would speak. You know what I'm trying to say? It's almost like, like a proverb. It's a saying that will stick with you through your, through your life. Something that Dad said or, or Grandpa or something like that. I was reminded of a story of a guy. I think it's a true story. I'm not sure. But he was, man, he just, I mean, he worked with his son all the way through elementary and getting into junior high school and, and uh, uh, you know, in football. And, and this kid was, I mean, he was great. I mean, astronomical a football player. And he was a quarterback. And he led the, the, the team in, in junior high and he went on into to, uh, to high school. And, and, man, he was a star quarterback there, too. In fact, at the end of, uh, towards the end of his high school years, uh, there was a scout that's in, at the audience there and they saw the way he was playing and gave him a full scholarship and a, and a very known, uh, a good, great college. And, and he went on from there to another scout, uh, just uh, signed him into a, a major league, a, a football league. And, and uh, he went on, he took his, and he was the, he was the uh, quarterback there too. And took his team on to be the Super Bowl, to the Super Bowl and won the Super Bowl. And they were interviewing this guy after all of this, all the blood, sweat, and tears that, that Dad put into this boy. And he said, "Thanks, Mom," <laughs> in the cameras. <laughs> so I'm not trying to diminish moms in any way because they have a special, special place in our hearts. Amen. Amen. But there's something about. When our father speaks, it just holds a lot of, I don't know, like I said, it's almost like reading a proverb. You could write it down and it just sticks with you from, from here on. You know what I'm saying? I'm not going to say some of the things that my dad has told me in the, in the past because it's not really appropriate right here. But, <laughs> right. 
But uh, I remember them nonetheless, right? Amen? I'm just something about that. But uh, our, the fathers are to instruct their children. First of all, they're a teacher. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 through 9, it says, These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them uh, when, you, when you sit it at home and when you walk along the way, a uh, road, excuse me, when you lie down and when you, when you get up, tie them as a symbol on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your house, houses and on your gates. It was up to fathers. This is fathers leading the instructions to fathers to remind your kids, bring them up in the ways of the Lord. This, he's talking about the law of Moses that was given to them. And they were to instruct their children throughout the day when they were walk, walking along the road. I, I can't count how many times I've uh, said something uh, to my, or, or just took the opportunity when we were driving or something like that to instruct my grandson or my granddaughter. Or my, my son or my daughter. Tell them some of the some of the things about life, some of the trips, or it's, you know what's going to uh, get them tripped up in life. Just to just give them some proverbs for their life, just to help them along the way. And that's what, in fact, that's what Solomon did. The whole book of Proverbs. And you want a good place to start, guys? There you go. That's it. Got thirty one of them, one for every day of the month. Right. I read Proverbs 4 this morning. Excuse me. In fact, uh, Proverbs 3, 5 and 6 says this. Trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and He will make your path straight. I would suggest that that be one of the first things that we teach our kids. Amen? Amen? Because there's a lot in that. In fact, I, I remember that. I can almost quote it uh, without writing it down. I did write it down because I ain't that good, but, but I did write it down. It says to write the scriptures, write the, uh, these laws on your doorposts. How many of us have scriptures on our walls at home? You know, I'm reminded of uh, uh, Joshua, I think it was, when he said, to, you know, choose, your, choose for yourself this day, and they were t because they were uh, in, in captivity, with the, and a, a lot of them were following the gods of, of their captives. And he said, you choose this day whether you're going to serve God or some of those little G gods. But he said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And we've got that posted in our house. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's, uh, that was for, for a long time. It was uh, when, before me and my wife moved, moved up to the, uh, to the Barnuminium when I finished it. We, uh, we had it on the wall as you came in the door. You could see it hanging up high. That's where it was. And now since we've moved down there, my daughter has moved it to a, another location. But it's right there at the front door when you come in the house. Just to remind us. I put it there to remind the, the kids and grandkids, me and my wife did, that we serve the Lord in this house. Amen? Amen. But that's a good starting point, point I think, guys, is to, uh, first of all, Deuteronomy 6, uh, 6, 6 through 9, it, it instructs us to teach our kids in this way. To continually speak to them about the ways of this life and about the ways of this world. Amen. But we're supposed we're to instruct our children in prayer as well. Look at Job chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. His sons used to take turns holding feasts in their homes. And they would invite their, their three sisters to eat and drink with them. 
when the period of feasting had run run its course, Job would send and have them pur uh, purified. Early in the morning, he would he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. Our regular custom should be to pray intercessory for our kids. Because I don't know about y'all, but what kind of kid y'all got, but mine can get up in some stuff. <laughs> they can get in some trouble. Amen. One of them anyway. <laughs> but they sure can. And you know, I, I think about the prodigal son, prodigal daughter. <laughs> 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 that daughter. I, it's, we have experience in that area, I guarantee you that. But uh, we need to pray for our kids that God would forgive them for their shortcomings. That's our responsibility as men. The same way Job did because he loved his kids. So he would regularly intercede for them in prayer before God. And he made sacrifices for them. We need to sacrificially pray for our, our children. How many stories comes to mind when we think about the when Jesus was walking on this earth? How many people came to Him when their children were sick or something like that? Lord, if you were just pleading for Christ to heal their kids. And He did every, every, every time. See, we need to pray for our kids. There's a certain way that we need to model love for our kids. Instruct them in love. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 33. This is one of my favorite places to read God's Word because it is, reminds me of the relationship I should have with my wife. And in chapter 6, uh, there, there's going to be the Scriptures after this relationship I need to have with my children and my mom. Starts out in verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave Himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the Word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hates his own body, but he feeds it and cares for it, just as Christ does the church. We are members of His body. For this reason, a man shall... And he's quoting the, the, the uh, Genesis chapter 3, I believe. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and will unite to, him, to his wife. King James says, cleaving to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Our children should see us as men having a loving relationship with their mother. We have a responsibility to model with a husband and wife, uh, the right relationship with a husband and wife, and model that for our children. To model love to them. I can guarantee you my kids and my grandkids, if they hang around with us for the day, if they're around us for the day, they hear us say I love you to each other many times. Because we do. If I walk outside, I say I love you, I might give her a kiss. I go do something outside. Same way with her. She, if she does something or leaves, she gives me a kiss and says, I love you. 
See, I think sometimes men's pride get right up in the way. And it's hard for them to say those words. I've met people that said, you know, just never tell their wife they love them. Oh, they know it. Yeah, they know. I know they know it, but they need to hear it. There's something about the spoken word. Amen? Amen. But our kids need to see us. Our daughters need to see uh, uh, see their, their dads not hitting their mom. Not saying a foul word to them. They need to see that. They need to see husbands respecting their wives and treating them properly. My kids see me as uh, with the uh, opening my the door for my wife, pulling out a chair for her when we go out to eat, taking care of her needs. If I'm the model of Christ in the church, then I'm the servant. Christ was a servant. To the church. Amen. He became a servant for the church. Our kids need to see us modeling that. Unfortunately, in today's society, is, you know, I'm a, let me go down the first rabbit trail. Just for, and I meant to, meant to put it in the opening, but guys, it, it really burns me up just a little bit that, that I'm expected, according, according to the PC, politically correct environment that I'm supposed to memorize all these different genders that they're coming up with. <laughs> that really bothers me. It does. It's kind of strange. This is going on YouTube and I'm about to get in trouble for it. But there's only two biological genders. Can I get an amen? Amen. <laughs> the rest of it, guys, is just uh, is desire and just a personal preference. I'll look around, make sure there ain't no kids in here. But a homosexual is a man desiring a man. A lesbian is one a woman desiring a woman. But they're desiring the biological sexes of two, right? I don't know how you come up with so many of them. And I'm not disparaging that at all. But I think it started going downhill, really downhill, when you had the, uh, when you, uh, had the hijacking of the wedding, of the marriage. A marriage is between a husband and wife, is what the Bible says. Now guys, I'm not trying to be a bigot here. I, I understand that if, you're, if you have a desire like that, you're going to want to be married. I understand that. But you do, we need to legally call it a civil union because it's not a marriage. Amen? Amen. I'm through with that rabbit trail. <laughs> <laughs> but we are to model to our children what God created us to be. Amen? Amen. We need to be a good example for our kids. Ephesians, go on to chapter 6 here. Uh, verses uh, uh, verses 1 through 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. As it said, the, the, the command says, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days be long upon the earth. It comes with a promise. Of course, I think back then you could kill your kids for doing something wrong. So if you want to honor and respect your mama, so your mom and daddy, so you don't get killed. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so you don't die. But it does come with a promise. We wouldn't dream of, of doing anything that or, or those who are Christians who are uh, not evil people wouldn't dream about doing that, doing something like that to their kids. But it says, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and you may enjoy a long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exacerbate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. There's two parts that I want to talk about because it's, it's broken up into two parts. But children, obey your parents. Let me ask you something, guys. Did you... you, you when do you stop being a, a child to your parents? Never. Never. That's exactly right. Never. We'll always be their kids. So when should you stop honoring thy father and thy mother? 
Never. Never, exactly. So if our kids see us honoring our mothers and fathers, we're modeling to them the relationship they should have with us. Amen? Sometimes they don't get it. <laughs> but uh, we need to bottle it down the west. You know, that's, uh, that's another thing I, I notice that people get kind of beat themselves up about their kids. You know, what did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? Guys, sometimes you don't do anything wrong. You know, I, I, I was talking about going back to the beginning right there. Uh, you know, God, the Father, is the most perfect father there ever has been. And look what Adam and Eve did. You ever think about that? No. If they messed up on him, don't get so don't beat yourself up so much about your kids messing up. Amen? Amen. But you need to love them like God loves us. Amen? Unconditionally and always be there for them. When they messed up, they're the prodigal son or daughter. And you welcome them back in over and over and over again. Amen? Amen. Never stop. We are to be good examples. It says on verse 4, Fathers, do not exacerbate your children. Instead, bring them up in the, in the training and instruction of the Lord. The Bible says in Proverbs, I think it's 22, but... Uh, 10 or 11, I think that's right. It might be 26, but I think it's 22. Train your, train your kids up in the ways of the Lord, and then when they are old, older, they will not depart from it. So, that kind of falls in line with that, guys, and what I'm saying here today. We need to teach our children. We need to teach our children. And it is up to the man, the husband, the father, to teach the, the, the kids the ways of this life. The pitfalls of this life. Amen? I mean, I understand that there's, uh, there's a lot of families with, without a husband, without a father in the, in the picture. And that, fall, that, that falls on the woman, on the, on the mom, to do it then. But whenever possible, there needs to be a male figure because it comes natural to us. Amen? To instruct children in that way. Last scripture I want to talk about is Malachi. And this is the comeback, talking about a comeback. Malachi chapter 4, verses, verse 6. And if you read all this, I mean, chapter 4 is talking about the day of the Lord that I explained, that I described earlier. But in verse 6 it says, He, he meaning uh, this is in reference to John the Baptist, He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, or else I will come and strike, come and strike the land with a curse. This is also found in Luke chapter, uh, chapter 1. And it's uh, uh, the angel Gabriel is quoting this same verse to uh, to Zechariah when he let him know about John the Baptist who was going to be conceived in Elizabeth's womb at an older age, as well as him being at an older age, and give birth to John the Baptist, John the Baptizer. But this is I wanted to, to use this scripture, God, because this is the heart of God, I believe. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. We're talking about as time goes on. As time goes on. I'm reminded when Christ was teaching that, uh, that uh, as we get into the end times, what we're finding ourselves into right now, we're on an accelerated course to the judgment day, to the church being raptured out, and then after that judgment, the world is going to continuously go away from God. And the world is going to continuously destroy the family, the family unit. But as God's people, we are instructed to make a comeback. We're instructed to do better. That's why I'm going to read that again, verse 6. He will, he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and the hearts of the children 
to their fathers. Christ was talking about the uh, the unsaved, the, the the world, when he said that. Uh, remember, we said uh, father will rise against uh, uh, child against father, parents, and, and things of that nature. Just be enmity in the family unit. That's happening. It's happening right now. But we need to make a comeback because we've lost a lot of ground. And I have no delusions that we can change the world right here. I just don't. But I'll tell you what we can do. Right here at Raptor J Cowboy Church here in Terrell, Texas, right here, we can make a comeback right here. Amen? Amen. That's our responsibility. And if God in a, in a movement, I feel like that's what He's doing here. And if He does that in other churches, before you know it, God's people are going to change. Amen? I've said all of this to say this, guys, that uh, just to wrap this thing up, that we, we can make a comeback. And it's time for making a comeback. It is up to the fathers, to men, to give Proverbs to their kids. And we have a men's ministry. And guys, I've seen a men's ministry in this church before, and it would just it would come, it would fizzle out, it would come, it would fizzle out. And I think because the structure wasn't there properly. I mean, it's more like a show up and cook, eat, talk, go home. You know, pray. But the men's ministry now, guys, it is, it is an environment for what I'm talking about here today to take place. When you can bring your, your kids, your, your young men, up here to church to the men's ministry, and they can learn from our examples. Because this main, what is, the main focus of today's scripture is men interacting with their sons and bringing them up in the proper way. Because if you continue to do that and you keep that going and going and going, repeating it year after year, generation after generation, then just like the Israelites passing down the law of Moses, it's going to get passed down. Amen? But we have a, we have a vibrant men's ministry right now. Guys, and I guarantee you, when you come there, you're going to learn. We'll have a different speaker each month. And uh, there was one that really sticks out in my mind where it's just one guy was speaking, his Mike from, uh, uh, I forget his last name, from, from uh, Dallas County Cowboy Church. He gave a, a really good, uh, 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 a really good, uh, he spoke very eloquently, a lot of, a lot of stuff out of the, the Bible. And we just continued to, to, to talk about that and to talk about the things... <laughs> What I'm saying is this, we don't just come read the Bible and say, here's what you ought to do, Dad gum it. No. We talk about our lives. We talk about the things that have been happening and the pitfalls that we've had to encounter in warning our kids. Amen? So guys, I'm, I'm saying that because like I said, it could be like a, 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 a good Father's Day message. And maybe, I'm saying we need a lot more of them. Amen? But we can make a comeback. We can make a comeback. We must make a comeback. And guys, I did most of this just to put a plug in there for our men's ministry. Amen? Amen. Amen. Gentlemen, I sure hope to see you there come this Friday. We feed everybody. Amen. <laughs> well, What's a good Baptist movement if you don't feed somebody, right? <laughs> We love to eat, but uh, <laughs> we used to call it bring something dead, throw it on the grill. But uh, somebody's pro providing food each, each each time, so can't really say that anymore. Guys, I'm gonna wrap it up right there because I've, I've I've said what I want to say and and. Uh, I hope I've expressed to you a desire, a need, a, a must-happen comeback. 
We need to teach our young men to be good young men. Upstanding young men. Amen. I look forward to our uh, women's ministry following and coming up to in the same way and same manner. Amen. That's what it's all about. In fact, Ephesians 5 goes on to talk about relationships of, of, uh, of, of wives and, and, and uh, slaves, slave levels, the way you work. you got a slave master you work for. All of that stuff. But you know, the, uh, the family unit that I was speaking of before the way to model, because it, it, it said, the reason I picked Ephesians chapter 5 is because I'll tell you it's a profound mystery that, that Paul was talking about, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. See, we create a, when, we, when the family is vibrant and is following the, the ways of the Lord, we paint a portrait of Christ and the church. Amen? Amen. It's a good portrait of Christ and the church. And he asks you this, are you part of the church? I'm not talking about coming up here and listening to me go on each, each Sunday. I'm talking about are you a member of the body of Christ? See, that's what the church is. The only way to be a member of the body of Christ is to ask Christ into your heart. And He makes you a member of His church. I want to give you an opportunity to do that now. I prayed earlier for that person who may be in this church that's lost. And I don't know how to describe this, guys, but if you feel a tug on your heart right now, right about now, I don't know, it's like a drawing. It's, like, it's almost like a magnet attracting another magnet. It's just a draw. See, that's the Holy Spirit calling to you. If it's left up to us, we'll never come to the Lord. But thank God He doesn't leave it up to us. He draws us to Himself. Would you answer that call here today? If you're feeling that, every head bowed, every eye closed. And I also remind you that the altar is open if you have something you need prayer for. We're here for each other. And it brings glory to God's name when we do that. If you want to ask Christ into your heart, you can do it right where you're sitting. Just admit to it, Lord, I'm a sinner. And right now, Lord, I turn from that sin. Lord, I agree that you're right and I'm wrong and I want to do things your way. So, Jesus, I'm asking you to come into my heart now. I receive you by faith into my spirit. I believe you died on that cross for my sins. That you rose back to life living in me now. I recognize you as my God, my Lord, and my friend. And from this moment forward, I will serve only you. In Jesus' precious, precious name. Amen. So the prayer, first, that, that prayer, God, for the first time, and more importantly than that, that you felt the presence of, of God begin to feel that emptiness you came to here with. Would you please come and see me right after services? That's the most important decision.